And in just a moment, Sinclair is going to come and preach to us from this passage, John's Gospel, chapter 1, and I'm going to read from verse 29 to 34. And if you're reaching for a black Bible, a, a church Bible, you'll find it on page 886, page 886 if you're using large print, 1053. Last week, Sinclair, Sinclair gave us the passage before this, the day before he came, and this evening, the day of the Lamb. The next day, he saw Jesus coming towards him. That is John, John the Baptist. He saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. Amen. Well, let's turn back in our Bibles to John 1, 29 to 34. If you need reminded, it's on page 886, or if you're using a large print Bible, it's on page 1053. Or if you're using my Bible, it's on page 991, the same text. Our series, uh, if you were here last Sunday, you may remember, is called A Week in the Life Of. And uh, what we've noticed is that John's Gospel is bookended by two different weeks the one we're more familiar with that begins in chapter 12 in Bethany outside Jerusalem and goes on from chapter 12 through to the end of chapter 20, one week in Jesus' life. And the other bookend, which we don't usually notice, but John seems to be anxious that we should notice, is right at the beginning of his public ministry. And it begins not at Bethany near Jerusalem, but as John tells us here, towards the end of last week's passage at Bethany on the other side of the Jordan. And the striking thing about last week's passage, I think, the day before He came, is that Jesus is not present physically, visibly at all. But John the Baptist's message is, I am not about me, I am about Him. You are focusing your attention on me, and you don't realize that everything that really matters to me is not me, but Him. Which, of course, is why John the Baptist is presented to us at the beginning of John's Gospel as the quintessential model witness. That's both his strength and his defense, as it's your strength if you're a believer, and your defense too that whatever comes to you in the way of opposition, as John experienced here, is in the last analysis, by God's grace, not really about you. It is actually about Him. And the earlier we learn that in our Christian lives, the easier it is to turn those arrows that come to us and deflect them to the Lord Jesus and say, Lord, I know this isn't really about me. This is really about you. But then something actually quite extraordinary happens at the beginning of this evening's passage. I said last week that John's gospel is more like a, an art gallery than it is like a photograph album. And so one of the intriguing things about John's gospel is 
there are all these little details that when you notice them, begin to fascinate you, and they seem to be there actually to draw you in. Don't know if you've ever been in an art gallery, not particularly interested in art, and you notice there's some idiot sitting there, and he's been sitting there since you went into the gallery, and he's still sitting there staring at the picture when you leave the gallery, and you wonder what he's doing. And what he's doing is asking questions about the picture. Why did the artist do this? And there's one of those elements here right at the very beginning of the passage. The next day, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming toward him, and that's the last appearance Jesus makes in the passage. What's so striking? It's so striking, I think you could read the passage and not notice it, is that there's actually no engagement in this passage between Jesus and John the Baptist. The very thing you would expect, in a sense, the very thing you want, this first public conversation after Jesus' baptism between John the Baptist and Jesus, and there's no conversation at all. Uh, most of us who have families of any size have at least one child who perpetually keeps asking the question, why? Or one grandchild who has the same genetic disorder, why? So why? Why does, why does John paint Jesus into the picture and then there is no engagement? Well, if you can give me a dogmatic answer that can be proved from Scripture, I think I can guarantee you an honorary doctorate of divinity, because the Scriptures don't tell us. Is it because he had a sense that John the Baptist had gone through a day when he had been under such pressure from the people who had come from Jerusalem? Or is it, as I'm more inclined to think, because Jesus was now coming back from his 40-day experience in the wilderness, and he must have looked different from the way John had seen him the previous occasion when he'd baptized him in the River Jordan, and that somehow or another, the very sight of Jesus was the final clue that John the Baptist needed to be able to identify Jesus precisely to John's own disciples because in fact, that's what this passage is taken up with. John the Baptist doesn't even address Jesus. He addresses those who are presumably his disciples with this extraordinary pronouncement, look, he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, I think if we're to get hold of this passage, we need to understand that this passage, like some other passages in, in Scripture, actually works the other way around. So that verse 29 is actually the conclusion to a series of insights that John the Baptist has had. And what follows in verses 30 through 34 is John's explanation to his disciples of how it is that he has reached this conclusion about Jesus. So the passage begins with, Jesus conclusion, with John's conclusion about Jesus and then goes on to John's explanation of how it was he came to this conclusion about Jesus. So what I want to do is to follow the chronology of the passage rather than the order of the verses so that, first of all, we can see into John's mind as he thinks about Jesus in order to be brought at the beginning of the passage in verse 29 to look through John's eyes to see Jesus as he really is. And if we do that, I think we'll notice that several things are happening in this passage. One is that John speaks about his vocation to be the forerunner to Jesus. The second is what he then goes on to explain in terms of how he came to a recognition of who Jesus really is. 
And that in turn leads, thirdly, to, in verse 29, the way in which he proclaims Jesus to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So, this is a, a, this is a very densely painted picture that is meant to bring us to be able to look through John's eyes, to see Jesus with John's eyes, and to recognize what John is saying when he proclaims Jesus to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So, first of all, I want to notice with you what John has to say about his vocation as the forerunner of Jesus, and we can look at this very briefly. He explains to us in verse 33 that he was sent to baptize. That is to say, this was the burden that God had given to him. He was sent to baptize, and that baptism had really multi-layered significance. There was a message attached to it. He proclaimed repentance because the kingdom of God was near, because the Messiah was coming. And he gave a visible sign, a sign that Jewish people would have associated virtually exclusively with Gentiles who were coming into the covenant community, this sign of being washed with water as a recognition of one's sinfulness and one's distance from God's covenant grace and one's desire to seek entry to that covenant. And then, of course, as John himself tells us, he understood that his role was exactly what Isaiah had prophesied in Isaiah 43, that he was a voice crying in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord. And so, what he's saying here is that it was his anticipation that through this ministry, in a way he was not yet absolutely clear to whom he was pointing, the one that God had promised through the ages as the Savior of his people, would be identified. And it's very difficult for us, I think, to take in the sense of privilege and burden that must have been to John the Baptist. The sense he must have had that he was, in that sense, absolutely the last, the climax of all the Old Testament prophets and their prophecies, right back to the prophecy that had been given in the Garden of Eden, that one would come to crush the head of the serpent, and that now he was standing on the mountaintop looking over And as he tells us, he's still not sure exactly who it is that's going to come. By which I think he means not that he didn't know Jesus at all, although that's possible. Remember how when uh, John begins his ministry in Luke's account, we're told that he actually came out of the desert into the beginnings of this ministry. And so, it's altogether possible that for these 30 years or so of John's life, he and Jesus had never met, but he probably doesn't mean, I didn't know Jesus. What he's more likely to have meant was, I did not know who it was going to be. But then, in the middle of these baptisms, I recognized by the indications God gave that the person who was the coming one was, in fact, Jesus, and that my whole ministry, in a sense, was now come to a climax, almost to an end, to be able to point to Him and to say to Him, I am the voice crying in the wilderness to prepare the way of the Lord, and my work is now done, because the Lord Himself has come and appeared to be the Redeemer of His people. So, this is the way in which John sees his vocation. But then, at a little greater length, we need to notice what John has to say about the way in which he comes to a recognition of Jesus' person. He believes that through this ministry, Jesus is going to be revealed, but the question for John is, as it would be for you, how, Lord? How am I going to know. 
And he explains to his disciples the, the pattern of revelation and illumination that went through his mind that enabled him to say when Jesus was baptized, this is the one. And what he says has got to do with the coming of the Spirit, you'll notice. The Father had somehow or another revealed to John the way you will know the one who is to come is that when you are baptizing, the Spirit of God will descend on him in the form of a dove and remain on him. So, three elements. The Spirit of God would descend on him. Second, the Spirit would come in the visible form of a dove. And thirdly, the Spirit who thus came would actually remain on him. Not in the form of a dove, but in the reality of his presence. Now, what did that signify to John? How, how would John have been able to put all this together with the, the understanding he had of the Old Testament Scriptures? Well, actually, relatively easily. First of all, because he was familiar, obviously, from the way he speaks about himself as a voice, that when Isaiah had spoken about the one who was to come, the Messiah, the servant of the Lord, he'd characteristically emphasized that he would be one upon whom the Spirit came. So, in Isaiah chapter 11, when he is prophesied, the message is that the Spirit will come and rest upon him. And when later on in Isaiah 42, we have the first presentation of the coming Savior as the servant of the Lord, the hallmark of his ministry, his service, is that the Spirit of the Lord will be upon him, and that will be manifested in the whole of his character and in his pattern of speech. And then towards the end, in the words that Jesus you remember expounded in the synagogue at Nazareth, what would be true of the coming one would be that he would be able to say, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. So, this was unlike any other baptism that John had ever administered. You'll know him because the Spirit will come upon him but Lord, how will I know the Spirit has come upon him? Answer, the Spirit will come, John understands, in the form of a dove. Now, we've no explanation of this, and I guess, actually, the reason we've no explanation is because John assumed his readers would understand. There's so much in John's gospel that is like a mosaic of Old Testament Scriptures. Just like the book of Revelation is a kind of mosaic of Old Testament Scriptures, he, he thought, he saw in terms of, of the Old Testament Scriptures being the lenses through which he viewed the Lord Jesus Christ. And I think that indicates to us the the one great event in the Old Testament that most of us associate with the coming of a dove. The experience of Noah and the flood and the coming of the dove and eventually the dove resting on the dry ground as an indication that now the judgment flood of God has come to an end and a new world is emerging. That's a very significant thing because uh, you may remember when, when Noah was born, his father, a man by the name of Lamech, deliberately chose the name Noah because the name Noah, as those little footnotes that as you get older get too small to read at the bottom of your Bibles, as most of our modern Bibles tell us, that the name Noah sounds like the Hebrew word for rest. 
We're calling him Noah because we hope this is the one who will bring rest. What was he talking about? He was talking about Genesis 3.15, about the promise of the one who would end the dominion of the serpent and bring into being a new order of reality in his kingdom and in his triumph. And Eve had hoped that her son, her firstborn son, might have been that deliverer, but no. And now Lamech, Noah's father, who holds on to that promise is saying, perhaps our son is the son that God is going to give who will bring rest. And the amazing thing is that Noah does bring rest, doesn't he? The judgment of God falls, the flood comes, the world is baptized, actually baptized by sprinkling that becomes a kind of immersion except for the little family and their animals in the ark who are preserved as the judgment of God falls on them and all around them. And then when the judgment is ended, the dove goes out and eventually the dove will not return. And what's really interesting about the Noah story is that when Noah emerges, there are two things very obvious about him. Number one is that God has made a new covenant with him. And number two, not only a new covenant, but he is, in a sense, a second Adam. And God's provisions and commands that had been given first in the Garden of Eden are rehearsed for Noah as, as it were, the leader of this new creation, that he isn't the one who brings the rest that's really needed. He's the one who, who brings as the second Adam a kind of picture of the rest that's needed. Just like we might say that Moses, who goes through a similar experience, we might call him a third Adam, who is to lead the people into the land where they might find rest, but they find no rest. And so, I presume that what John sees in this picture, both John see in this picture is that now at last in Jesus is the beginning of God's last new covenant not now the fourth Adam, but as Paul says, the last Adam. And it's on him that the judgment is going to fall. What his baptism means, as Jesus actually makes fairly clear in Luke's gospel, when he says, I've still got a baptism to be baptized with, and I'm held in until it's accomplished. What this baptism really means is that this is the one on whom the judgment of God is going to fall, but this is also the one who, having experienced the judgment of God, will also be the one through whom the dove of rest comes to bring rest. And friends, you need to read Matthew eleven twenty-eight to 30 through these biblical lenses, don't you, when you hear Jesus say, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You're not just picking a neutral word out of the blue. He's saying it's in me that it's happening. It's in me that you can have what humanity has longed for and needed since the very beginning of time. And so the Spirit comes, and the Spirit comes in the form of a dove, and John's able to see who this one is, and then John has had revealed to him. Or perhaps he has simply been able to see it in the Old Testament Scriptures, unlike all the prophets before on whom the Spirit came from time to time to enable them to exercise their ministry. 
when the Spirit comes on this one, the Spirit will remain. And you get little indications in John's gospel and in the other gospels, and actually in Paul's letters as well and elsewhere in the New Testament, that, that there are signs of that all the way through Jesus' ministry. The Spirit who had come in His conception was the Spirit who now came for this new season of public messianic ministry. And Jesus Himself says, so when I work miracles, it is through the power of the Spirit. When I heal, it's through the power of the Spirit. When I speak with authority, that's the mark of the power of the Spirit. And when He dies on the cross, He is upheld by the power of the Spirit. As Paul says, when He rises from the grave, His resurrection takes place through the power of the Spirit. So that from womb to tomb to throne, the Spirit of God remains on the Lord Jesus. And the significance of that, I think, will become clear for us in a minute. But this is how John the Baptist is able to identify Jesus. You'll, you'll know John because as he comes, as he comes in the midst of the people, something unique will happen. The Spirit will descend. The Spirit will come in the form of a dove and the Spirit will never leave him and be evident all the way through his life. Have you ever noticed a, a, a very interesting connection between John 1 and John 14? Remember when Philip says in the upper room to Jesus, Jesus just show us the Father and that's, that will be enough for us. And Jesus says, Philip, how can you have been with me this long without understanding he who has seen me has seen the Father. He's not confusing himself with the Father, is he? He's saying, Philip, I'm his son. See me. See my Father. But then a little later on, he says something very similar about the Holy Spirit. He says, but dear ones, you, you know the Holy Spirit. How do we know the Holy Spirit? Well, he says, because you have seen him in me. You've seen his ministry in me. It's just a little indication right at the end of Jesus' ministry that what John had been told at the beginning of Jesus' ministry had actually been so true, Jesus himself could say to his disciples, you've actually seen the proof of what John the Baptist said about me that the Spirit who descended from heaven onto my life in the form of a dove, that Spirit has been my constant companion throughout my life. And John also is given some insight into what the implication of that is going to be, not only for Jesus, but also for ourselves. And so he sees the Spirit on Jesus. And it's as he puts all of these things together, if we can put it this way, as, as the divine optometrist crafts the prescription for John's lenses, like at first sight it seems he's, he's combining a welter of Old Testament scriptures until eventually those scriptures all seem to be able to fit into a pattern. And John is able to say, oh, now I see it. He's the Son of God. He, he remembered, didn't he? He remembered the voice that had come from heaven that said, this is my Son. That's who he is. He is none other than the Son of God. And this that comes right at the end of the passage is actually the beginning of his proclamation. He's the Son of God. And John has prepared us for that, hasn't he? Earlier on in the passage, he said, that, first of all, I need to tell you who this is that we're going to be thinking about here. He's the Word who was face to face with God. 
like a father looking into the eyes of his son, a son looking into the eyes of his father. And he's come into the world, this son, in order that those who receive him might become the children of God. So he's the son of God. And then you see, in addition to being the son of God, John tells us something else about him, something I think just as remarkable about him. And that is that he's not only the one who bore the Spirit from his baptism to his resurrection, he's the one who after his resurrection will bestow the Spirit on his people. This one on whom you see the Spirit descend in the form of a dove and remain, this is the one who will baptize you, not with water as I do. He will baptize you with His Holy Spirit. You need to see the picture. Um, It's obviously not clear how did John administer baptism. The one thing we can be sure of is that somehow or another he got the water over the baptized. And that's what he's saying about Jesus. But what he's saying about Jesus is that when he baptizes, it won't be with water. What he will give will be his own Holy Spirit. And friends, this is, this is to me one of the great mysteries of the gospel and the Christian life, as well as one of the great explanations of why we are the way we are as Christians and why we are the way we are as a living church. Because it's this, that every single individual the Lord Jesus baptizes with His Holy Spirit, He baptizes with one and the same Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who in these years was upon Him is the very Spirit that He pours out upon you. That's why we're closer to one another than many of us may be, even to our own flesh and blood, because there is something within us by God's grace that in that sense is thicker than native blood. It's the same Holy Spirit. I I cannot do the mathematics. I cannot understand the mystery, but I can experience the reality that in this room, if there are 90 or 100 of us in this room, there are not two different Holy Spirits, Jesus' Holy Spirit and the one we share, nor are there a hundred different Holy Spirits, each of us possessing our own, but one and the same Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit who was on the Lord Jesus, that by His grace He comes in the gospel to share with us. I've thought long and hard about the fact that if I treated my fellow Christians with that thought in the lenses through which I viewed them, I would treat them with a sense of awe and gentleness, love and devotion, that this is a brother, a sister, a spiritual father or mother, or son or daughter, in whom the very same Spirit dwells as dwells in me, more than that, in whom the very same Spirit dwells as who came to dwell in our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. And as John begins to put these together, And you notice that much of this is drawn from the prophecy of Isaiah. It's almost as though his mind (laughs) works on through the prophecy of Isaiah, and he says, now I've got it. Now, Now I can put it together. This Son of God, who is the true and final Noah, who baptizes with the Holy Spirit, is none other than the Lamb of God who will take away the sin of the world. And of course, among the passages that may have been in his mind, I think there is no doubt that in his mind is Isaiah 53, the servant of the Lord who was led as a lamb 
to the slaughter. The servant of the Lord who was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities, upon whom was the chastisement that would bring us peace, with whose stripes we would be made whole. That's what that finger means when it points his disciples to Jesus, and John the Baptist says, just look. That's all you need to do. Just look, because he is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And you know, if you, if you try and take in this whole picture, the baptism and what John the Baptist is saying here, and stand back as though you were in an art gallery and you were looking at a frieze of these extraordinary moments in John the Baptist's life, what would you see? There's a very interesting detail that Luke gives us. He says, John the Baptist was baptizing many days, but there was only one day Jesus came and it seems he came at the end of the day. It's fascinating. Luke says, when everyone else had been baptized, then this one came. Now just sit in the art gallery and look at that. What do you see? You see a river Jordan that John the Baptist has been pouring cleansing water over multitudes of sinners, so that symbolically their sins would be washed into the River Jordan. And now at the end of the day, when all the sins are symbolically there, he washes Jesus with the sin-laden water of the River Jordan. And it's the whole of the gospel, isn't it? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement that was upon him was to bring us peace. It's with his stripes that we are healed. You could almost see those words underneath the freeze. Viewer, if you seek the meaning of this picture, behold the Lamb of God taking away the sins of the world. It would be marvelous if we had a baptism tonight, don't you think, after all that? But the great thing is, that sign and this sign, yes, they have two slightly different meanings, but they present one and the same Savior. And this one, as much as that one, bids us to use our eyes and to see, and to see through and beyond the signs to the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. Friends, He's everything. He's the Son of God who has come to bring us into the family of God. He's the giver of the Spirit of God in order that we might begin to live the life of God. And He's the Lamb of God so that all our guilt, all our shame, all that gnaws our consciences might be drowned forever in his baptism. So let's come and behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for giving us the Lord Jesus. We pray that you would open in our hearts eyes of faith to see him as he is. To behold him. Focus our gaze, we pray, in these coming moments on him alone, that we may love him better that we may trust Him with greater confidence, that we may live the new life for His glory. Forgive our sins, Lord Jesus, we pray, and help us to believe that if you have undergone 
the baptism of blood upon the cross of Calvary, then surely our sins are purged and a new day has begun. And help us, we pray, even as our consciences condemn us, to remember that your blood is stronger than our conscience, your sacrifice greater than our sin, your presence more wonderful than all our fears. So lead us, we pray, to the table. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.